turn to Acts chapter 20. We'll get there in just a moment. If you want to read it from your own Bible. I have it on the notes here. But <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit of truth that exalts Jesus in your word. And we ask you to bless us even now as we speak and hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I want to talk about how to discern cults. And the, the point that I really want to focus on is that I would like to, or, or the point, the takeaway is, is that I would like you to be able to say this some months from now, at least identify four or five of these just out of memory without having to look at a handout. And my point in doing this is not just so that you won't ever be deceived, but that you would be equipped to help others that are being lured in in the early stages of a cult. I mean, we're living in the midst of a cult being in our midst recently, and so we're wanting to take immediate action, and this is one of our action steps, to, uh, to do this. Now, I asked my wife, I quizzed her, made her kind of my experiment. I said, tell me this, because she's heard this over the years, tell me the seven characteristics of a cult. I mean, it's been on the website for some years. And she says, okay, after you tell me the seven characteristics. <laughs> okay, I had to look at my notes, I admit. I said, okay, I can say most of them. No, uh, my point is that you could be able to just, in normal conversation, be able to alert and to help and to warn other people. Paragraph A, kind of a working definition. This is not a complete definition of a cult. It's a group that deviates from the doctrines and practices of historic Christianity. It's a group that has an inordinate loyalty to one leader. Inordinate meaning not appropriate, a outside of the bounds of the Bible. Now I'm going to talk about cult leaders and false teachers to, uh, 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 this morning. The Bible mentions false teachers, but many false teachers are itinerant, and they travel around or they speak through the media, but when a false teacher has a close-knit group associated with them, then that false teacher is more than a false teacher. They're also a cult leader. Now, cult leaders or false teachers, they typically see themselves and their group as the only group that has the complete truth. Now, as I mentioned these seven characteristics, if a group has one of them, they have, that, that, that doesn't mean they are a cult but it means they have cult-like tendencies. Even one of these should be a red flag. And so I, I, I want you to begin to uh, uh, have that in your mind when you're talking to people so you can identify that clearly. Now, cults don't start the first day as a full-blown cult, cult. They start with a few tendencies, and they escalate, and they morph into something far more dangerous as time unfolds. In paragraph B, we want you to be equipped to see it, but we want you to be equipped to expose it so that you can warn and rescue other people that you love, even in the early stages of their involvement in a group that's maybe just beginning in that direction. Paragraph C, knowledge is so powerful. To be informed is, is so such a powerful safety. The devil's weapon is deception. The Lord uses truth. Jesus said, truth will liberate you. And the opposite is deception will bring you into bondage. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed by the lack of knowledge. People that are involved in cults, they are much as destroyed in their life because they lack just basic fundamental knowledge. Paragraph D, this is a very alarming passage in Acts chapter 20. It's actually a prophecy. Paul the Apostle is warning the eldership of the mightiest church in the book of Acts, the church of Ephesus. I mean, we have first the church of Jerusalem as the main, uh, as kind of the epicenter of revival. Then a few years later, it's the church of Antioch. Then a few years later, it's the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus actually had the most powerful and influential church in terms of reaching the number of people by the revival that touched Ephesus. You can read about that in Acts 19 and 20 if you want. Paul spent three full years there. 
Now when he's about to get on the ship and leave Ephesus after three years and a great revival that's reaching the whole known world coming out of that, uh, that, that city there, he gives the elders this prophecy. And I mean, it's a pretty disturbing prophecy. He says in verse 29 of Acts 20, for I know this. I mean, and he's going to talk about the future, so he's prophesying. After I leave, when I get on that ship, in the, in the months and years ahead, savage wolves are going to come in and not spare the flock. Now, savage wolves are false teachers. He says, but don't just look for new guys coming in. Verse 30, this is the, this is the part that's so disturbing. He goes, talking to the elders, even from, from you, some of you, you will rise up in a, in a wrong way. You'll begin to speak perverse things, some of you guys. I mean, Paul the apostle put those elders in place. It says in verse 28, the Holy Spirit made them elders, but he said some of you, the Holy Spirit's telling Paul, are actually going to change the way you function in leadership. You'll draw disciples after yourself. You'll speak perverse things. You will become cult leaders, some of you. I mean, I mean that's in the Bible. I read that and I thought, oh my goodness. So Paul tells them, watch not only the new leaders coming in, watch even your own leadership. Now, he's not trying to make everybody suspicious so everybody's guilty till proven innocent, but he's saying, be alert, be attentive. The problem will never go away. The problem will never, there will always be that tendency. Later on, I, I have in the paragraph, Paul gave prophecies about the generation the Lord returns, the end times. Jesus gave prophecies about the generation that he would return, and the prophecies included deception going to a level beyond any other time in history is what it describes. That as the end time revival escalates, deception will escalate as well. And that will be deception inside the church as well as deception outside the church. Let's look at paragraph F. I just want to mention uh, briefly, this is not uh, comprehensive, these next couple paragraphs, uh, just a couple of the beliefs that are standard that when people begin to drift from these beliefs, then they uh, are, are uh, if they, they, they begin to drift and then they actually deny some of them, that's a sign of a cult. Paragraph F, false teachers, they don't uphold the main and plain doctrines of the Bible. The big battle today going on in the spirit is a battle for truth, particularly defining who Jesus is. And more than that, defining how we are to love him or to respond to him. People are coming up with ways to love God that are outside of the biblical definition. I mean, it's humanistic, man-made ways. And, the, and cults uh, focus on this kind of thing. They call it loving God. The Bible makes it clear we have to love God on God's terms. With allegiance to Jesus in the way the Bible says we are to have allegiance to Jesus. Paragraph G. Just a snapshot, not comprehensive. We must accept these main historical Christian doctrines. Cults drift away from these and then deny some of them, but many cults uphold some of these. But the problem is they don't uphold all of them. That's the problem. Now we have our doctrinal statement and we have the, some of the main historic creeds on our website in a number of places and you can Read that later and become familiar with these uh, things that the Bible makes clear that are the essentials of the faith. Things like Jesus is God's only son. He's fully God, fully man. His death, his resurrection. One God in three persons, the Trinity. Salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. Those are essential. The infallibility of the Scripture is the final authority of all matters of faith and practice. And another one very important that some people don't emphasize, the unity and diversity of the body of Christ. The fact that we must love the whole church, even the part of the church that looks different than us. We must love the whole church. We stand firmly with the teachings of historic Orthodox Christianity as defined by statements like the Apostles' Creed 
or the Nicene Creed that we repeat publicly on a monthly basis or the Westminster Confession. And again, we have all these creeds and statements on our website. Okay, those are just some, a, a quick framework of what we must believe and cults drift from that. They believe part of it, that's the problem. They believe part of this, but they don't believe all of it. Top of page two. Let's look just real quick at, eight, at seven characteristics and we're gonna spend more time on the first one than the other ones because the other ones all flow out of the first one actually. The first uh, characteristic of a cult that I l want to alert people of, they oppose critical thinking. Now I'm using the word critical thinking in a technical sense. I don't mean a critical spirit. That's not what I mean. But I mean the, that uh, 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 boldness, but more than boldness, it's just the, the uh, fundamental need to ask questions. And here's the question that a critical thinker asks. Is what I'm hearing actually right? And if it's right, why do I think it's right? That's what I mean by critical thinking, objective thinking that compares what's being taught to the written word of God. The Bible demands that we think for ourselves. One of our uh, purposes at IHOP used to raise up a generation that thinks for themselves. They will never be safe, no believer is, if they're not thinking for themselves. Now what cults do is they tell you you have to believe what the, what the, what the uh, primary leader believes, and the idea is just to parrot the ideas of the primary leader without seeing them in the Bible. Number two, the Bible says we have to teach, we have to test all things. Now we test all things simply, one simple way, by comparing it with the Scripture. When we, see, when we hear a teaching, the thing that we say regularly to our, our, our uh, I hop you students at the, or, at the orientation is this uh, statement. I love to say this statement. If you don't see something with your eyes in your own Bible, a teaching that's being taught, if you don't see it with your own eyes in your own Bible, then reject it. Do not receive it till you see it with your own eyes in your own Bible. That's very important. And if you don't see it, challenge it, but not in a proud spirit. I'm not talking about using knowledge to show off so that you can impress the girls in the class how much you know. That's not what I'm talking about or how bold you are. I'm, I'm talking about using this challenging, this, this demand, this requirement to challenge in a spirit of love to build up, not to boast. And so some, uh, some young people do it to boast and show off and and uh, uh, I, did, I know about that, not just because I see it. I did a little bit in my day. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Loyalty to a ministry requires that you challenge the ministry, again, with the right spirit and kindness and humility in the right way. It, if you really are loyal to a ministry, you must challenge it if things are wrong. Colts will tell you that loyalty to a ministry means just wholesale agreeing with it and never thinking it through. I don't care if it's your favorite teacher, you must see it with your own eyes. And you don't want to say, one thing I've, I've encouraged our young people over the years is don't say Mike Bickle said, Alan Hood said, Wes Hall said. When, when talking about truth, say the Bible said. And if you can't say the Bible said, then don't talk about that truth. Don't promote that truth. Only promote truth that you can say the Bible says. You don't have to know where it's at and to quote it exactly, but the truth itself. If all you know is that a leader said it, you should not be promoting that truth till you can actually say it and defend it from the Bible yourself. It's not healthy for people to promote truth that they only know secondhand because their favorite teacher said it. Whether somebody on TV or a, or a book, that's not good enough. Most of you are aware of that. Paragraph 4, Acts chapter 19, I mean Acts 17. The Bereans, they were highlighted and affirmed for their nobility, is what it says. They were noble-minded. Now the Bereans, they, they were the believers that lived in a city called Berea. That's why they're called the Bereans. And they were eager, they were, with all readiness, they received the word of God, meaning they were teachable, they were hungry for the word. When Paul the apostle came in town, 
They'd never heard of Paul, and he comes in town and is teaching, and I have no doubt. They said, you know what? Uh, this feels like the presence of God. It resonates in our spirit. It's true. We like this guy. But that's not good enough to feel the presence of the Spirit, to like the guy, and to have a sense it's true. They said, we got to take it the next step. Look what it says. They searched the Scriptures to see if it was in the Bible. Paul, we like you. Feels, I mean, the presence of God is here, and it, and it resonates in our spirit, but that's not enough. We're going to find from the Bible where it's at. Now note this. It says they searched the Scripture. All they had first hundred years of Christianity was the Old Testament. When they said they searched the Scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. The reason I highlight that, some people think the Old Testament's invalid because of the New Testament. And that's not a, 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 that's not a biblical answer. That's the only Bible that Paul preached from. And it's the only Bible that they searched in the early church was the Old Testament because the, the New Testament wasn't put together for another couple hundred years and officially canonized. The epistles were floating around. So they had access to that. Now in the last week, we had people with, in open forums uh, in small groups and, and, and big groups and, and people. And the th I was very impressed because... A number of people challenged ideas and thoughts in small settings and large settings. And I was impressed by that. I, I, that's healthy. That's good. And the reason I was impressed by it, because they challenged it boldly, but with tenderness and humility. See, that's the balance. It's not challenge to boast, but challenge to build up. That's the biblical balance. And I felt uh, uh, good about the healthy way that people did that. Number two, in terms of cults, they dishonor the family unit. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit less time on, the, on, the, on these, uh, these six. We're just going to look at them pretty fast. Most of them are pretty self-evident. So it's not like it's so enlightening because it should be pretty obvious. But I want, I want to identify the truth so you can help others as well that might be in the early stages or a group that is developing these tendencies. Well, a cult will dishonor the family unit. The Bible insists the family unit is the first relational priority that we should be committed to. Number one, the cults will teach the children, whether they're the 10-year-old children or the 20-year or 30-year-old children, to listen to the cult leader, not their parents. And there's a lot of folks around the earth in their 20s, they cut off their parents and they listen to the cult leader. And if anybody suggests that, that's already a red flag. Even the, even the hint of that is a red flag. Another dimension is that the cult leader will urge the women to be more loyal to the cult leader than to their husbands. And what's more destructive or, or more uh, horrible, or I don't know what the word is than, than all, is that there are husbands under the seductive influence of a cult that actually think that's normal. There are some, some, some men that allow a cult leader to have more influence over their children and their spouse because they think it's loyalty. I mean, that is perverse beyond measure when that happens. Number two, they cults will require, not always at first, but eventually require members to break ties with their families and even their friends. And they may not do that in the early days when they're just getting formed in their perverse ways. But whenever there's even the hint of breaking relationship with your family or friends, uh, because they have a secret truth they don't want anybody else to know or challenge, that is a, uh, uh, that, that a cult-like tendency. I mean, that's very serious. Number three. The Bible makes it clear our first relational priority is to one's spouse, children, and parents. That our identity in the relational sense, or I mean our identity is with the Lord, but in the human relational sense, our identity is with our family far before we have an identity with the ministry. But in cults, that's opposite. They are a part of the cult, and their families, they either don't, they don't interact with them, or they're never open and honest with them, uh, and and uh, every version of that. Now, there are times where parents really are wrong and really are abusive. And so I'm not under, uh, underplaying or minimizing 
you know, one young person might say, yeah, if you knew my father, he is so controlling, abusive, and wow, and I, I acknowledge that. And so I'm not saying that you have kind of just, well, that's my dad, so he must be right, because there's a lot of, of wrong things that have happened in life, and, and a lot of parents have wrong ideas, and they have wrong hearts, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's what I'm saying. The Bible makes it clear that we always fight for the relationship to be restored. No matter how much pain or wrong, we don't just say, we're going to trade in our family for the cult. We always say, Lord, I'm fighting for love and restoration. I want to see the wrong things healed in the relationship, and they may not succeed. There may not be reconciliation, but as a lover of Jesus, we fight for the relationship with our family all the days of our life. We pray for it. We work for it. We forgive we appeal, we humble ourselves, we do everything to see the communication restored. But here's the point I'm, I'm, I'm making here in, in, in a cult. They want to replace the family with the cult. And they, don't even, and they say, don't fight for the relationship. Abandon the relationship. And that's obviously completely false. If you see that in any way, red flag, red flag, red flag. We fight for the relationship with our family Oh, as long as we have breath. Top of page three. Characteristic number three of a cult. They isolate their members from, from their family. They isolate the members from the larger church. They isolate their members from society. But they go more, they go beyond that. They penalize the members in their cult if they refuse to isolate. And particularly if they leave. I mean, they start penalizing them, say, hey, what about the commitment to our group here? Why are you interacting with the people back home? And, and the cults don't like that, and they begin to penalize them. And then if the person leaves the cult, then they threaten them with judgment, and they shun them, and they pronounce uh, horrible things over them. When people leave cults, sometimes it takes months, sometimes even years uh, before they overcome the fear, because they heard it for so many years uh, from their cult of the fear of, what if I'm going to be judged if I leave the cult? Or what if I miss God's best? And mostly the cults go a little bit heavier than you'll miss God's best, but they all say at least that. If you leave our apostolic covering, that's how they say it, you won't have God's best. But mostly cults take it to the next level. And they start saying, you will be judged by God. A car wreck is coming soon. A calamity is coming soon. And, and I mean people that leave groups for months sometimes and even years, they're thinking, is that because I left the group? No. You're not having this trouble because you left the group. You didn't leave God's blessing because you left their apostolic covering. They don't have an apostolic covering. It's deception. Matter of fact, you're in God's blessing because you're relating to your family again and you're relating to the larger body of Christ and you're connecting to Jesus instead of to your cult leaders, your primary uh, source of, of, of connection with truth. Now, one thing a cult will, will say, and other groups say this that are not cults, but I think it's that the vast majority of the time, there could be a few exceptions because I, I don't claim to know how it works every, in every place, but when they push for this lifelong commitment to the group, and I don't mean a lifelong commitment to love or to relate to one another. I think that's, that's good. That we want to commit to love each other and to relate to each other. That's good. But a cult takes it to another degree you have to stay in the group with us in this location. And there's other groups. I mean, there's some good guys out there that do a bit of that too. I've heard it over the years. That they push people to make a lifelong commitment, not just to be in relationship and to love each other from different parts of the earth, wherever God might lead them, but they say you have to stay here in this group, in this location with us. And I've had uh, guys over the years, in the 35 years I've pastored, where there's always a, a guy or two, every you know, few years, some guy will hear about a group that makes a long-term commitment. They say, hey, that sounds exciting. You know, it sounds noble, like secure long-term relationship. And, and I've had maybe a few times over 35 years where a few leaders have said, hey, why don't we do that? 
And I've always had this very strong uh, a feeling about that, that no, we don't need to do that. Rather than making a lifelong commitment to all stay in this group, in this location, wherever it might be, the phrase I have used for many years is let's make a lifelong commitment to support each other in the will of God. And wherever the will of God brings us, let's be committed to support each other in the will of God. Let's do that. That I can do. But cults will push you for a lifelong commitment, and sometimes other people will too. And again, I wouldn't call them automatically a cult, but I would certainly be alerted when people start talking that way. Because there's no, ne there's no need to do that from how I could see it. Again, there might be an exception that I don't know about uh, out there, and I'll leave that between the Holy Spirit and whatever he says to somebody, but I'm always alerted when somebody says that. At all. I'm always a little bit troubled by that. I have uh, heard that kind of language for 35 years, and I, I can only think of one or two groups that have ever stayed together the long haul. Almost always, the 5 or 10 or 15 years mark, they all break up, and they get mad at each other and do all kinds of things. I got hundreds of examples of that. So anyway, I'm alerted by that. And if God wants us to work together in the same ministry, we don't have to know today. Let's just do the will of God in the present tense and let the years unfold. You know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, look back and say, guess what? We stayed in the same ministry together. There you have it. Then go have a party or something. We don't have to know on the front end. Now, another uh, alarm that I... That I uh, uh, something that alarms me, and I hear this by good guys, and I don't call the people who say this a cult, but I am alarmed by it. It's when a leader says that you have to get my permission before you leave my ministry to join another. And I've had young people over the years say, well, you know, I need to get permission to do this or that. And I go, permission or counsel? And I, you know, I want to get them to distinguish it. And they go, and I said, counsel is good. Permission? Uh, to move from here to there, I said, that's a, that, that's a red flag uh, 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 when, when somebody does that. Because leaders don't own the people. The Lord owns the people, not the leaders. And I, I'm all for counsel, but permission is a whole different issue. So when guys say that, I'm always a bit alarmed by that. I, red flags go up. I remember 13 years ago when IHOP first started, and I spoke at the citywide pastors uh, group that I'm a bit a part of uh, for some years before IHOP began. It's called the Midwest Ministers Fellowship at MMF. There's about two or 300 leaders and pastors, and it's a monthly meeting, and I've spoken at it several times in the 13 years. And when IHOP first started, they wanted me to kind of give the vision. And one of the things that I say regularly to leaders, and we started IHOP with this, uh, with this principle, you know, our copyright's the right to copy. That's principle number one. Principle number two, we got a few of them that I told the leaders, any of you can come to IHOP at any time you want and recruit any of our people anytime you want, and you don't have to say anything to me. And so different leaders have come to IHOP, and, and they want to recruit people. I love that. I tell leaders from around the world, you can recruit. You can do what you want. I don't, we don't own them. We are cheerleaders for them doing the will of God. We want to help them do the will of God wherever it's at. Well, one pastor, and this is certainly not indicative of, of, of MMF, this. This is just one pastor. It's his own way of thinking. He came and said, hey, can I have permission to uh, uh, recruit that worship leader, a young lady? And, and I knew what he meant, but I was just being a little bit ornery just for a moment here. <clears throat> which is so unlike me, but anyway, <laughs> I said, uh, no, you can't. And he looked at me and says, oh, I thought a few months back you said we could recruit anybody. I said, you can't. He goes, well, then why won't you give me permission? I said, because I don't have the authority to give you the permission to do that. That's between her and the Lord. You go offer her a role. And I said, pay her some money. <laughs> Honor her. Bless her. And I said, if she likes it, and she gets counsel from her parents, or some friends, whatever, and it seems right, I'm going to encourage her to go. He goes, oh. I said, the reason I won't give you permission, because if she joins you under that premise, you're going to think she needs permission to leave you. So I said, I'm going to help her leave here and join you, but I'm going to help her leave you and join the next place in the will of God. 
So I don't want her getting permission to leave or to join. That's not what we're talking about. And what I really want is not just uh, that people would appreciate that. I want to raise up young people with this kind of paradigm of leadership. I don't just want 20-year-olds to, to be free of that yoke being on them. I don't want them to put that yoke on others when they get older and they grow into leadership. I don't want that yoke put on them. So I want to give you that paradigm shift. That uh, some people grow up in settings where the leader is the owner of that congregation. And they try to extract long-term commitments out of them. Beloved, let's do the will of God in the present tense, and let's help each other do it, and let's celebrate that. And number two, the Bible answer is this. As shepherds, as pastors, as leaders, we are called to help people succeed in the will of God for their life. We want to help them succeed spiritually. We want to help them succeed relationally. We want to help them succeed in their, in their finances, in their ministry. Our goal is not to use our influence to keep them in our system. Our goal is to use our influence to help them succeed in the will of God wherever that placement might be. Because the foundational value is they belong to God, not to the leaders that they're serving Jesus under the oversight of those leaders. Okay, let's go to uh, characteristic number four. A cult, a cult group will uh, uh, promote and, and insist on an inappropriate loyalty to them and to uh, get them to connect to the leader and obey the leader instead of connecting to Jesus and obeying, the, and, and obeying Jesus. Now, I believe in honoring leadership. In Hebrews 13 and a number of places, the Bible teaches us to honor leadership. And I don't believe in just people church hopping ministry and never ever being committed to a body of believers, but they're committed to that body in as much as it's the will of God for that season of their life. And they're under the oversight of that, of that leadership in as much as that leadership is helping them to say yes to Bible truths and cooperate in the life of that community. And, and it, it's a soft leadership. It is not a leadership that has the right over the direction of that person's life. You know, some places they have to get permission before they can marry somebody or permission before they move or permission before lots of things. And I'm just really troubled by that kind of stuff because there's a difference between permission and counsel. I believe in counsel, but not permission. Now, what the cults do is they define loyalty uh, to the leader. And, def and defining loyalty, they, here's how they define it, by never correcting the leader, by always agreeing with the leader. That is not a, definition, a biblical definition of loyalty. Loyalty is a commitment to walk in love. It's not a, commission, a commitment to agree with everything and never to challenge it. A cult will define faithfulness, I have written here, as supporting and obeying the leader instead of obeying Jesus. And say, boy, that brother's really faithful. Well, why is he really faithful? Well, he's been here for years. Okay, that's pretty good. But is it the will of God for them to be here for years? Yes, okay, well, then good, that's faithful. And some people define faithful because the people stay there and obey them. And that's not the biblical definition of faithfulness. It's that they're obeying again Jesus, they're connecting to Jesus. That's what leaders do. They help people connect to Jesus in a greater way. So they hold on to the head. Jesus is the head, Colossians 2.19. One of the main tactics that's used over the years is this whole uh, foolishness and gibberish about mantles. I, I've heard it for 35 years, and, and so almost all of it is foolishness, in my opinion, non-biblical, manipulative foolishness, and I can give you a few more adjectives if you want me to go on. Tell you how I really feel. And here's how it goes. You know, if you are faithful to serve, you will get my mantle. There's so many things wrong with that statement. Number one, that cult leader doesn't have a mantle. Number two, he can't give it to you even if he has it. Number three, you don't want it if he can give it to you. <laughs> Honestly. And number four, he's promised that mantle to ten other people in the group. And when he talks about that mantle, he's looking at the group, 
And all of them are winking at him, and he gives one wink, and they go, yeah, yeah, we connected. He's deceiving and manipulating. Beloved, you don't want somebody's mantle. You want your own assignment from the Lord. When I stand before Jesus on the last day, when you do, he's not going to talk to me about somebody's mantle. He's going to talk to me about my assignment in the Lord. And that's the only one that works anyway in my heart, in the grace of God, is my own assignment. Well, they say, you know, if you'll be faithful, which translates, do everything I say and do all the dirty work, you will get my mantle one day. Again, he's promising it to 10 people. He doesn't have a mantle. He can't give it, and you don't want it. That settles it. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> then they talk about, which is in the same spirit. Well, 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 before we move on, let's get back to that mantle thing for one more moment. Somebody might say, what about Elijah and Eli Elisha giving his mantle to Elijah? He did. There you go. Okay, let's go to the next point. <laughs> like, so what? What has that got to do with you and that cult leader? It has nothing to do with you and that guy. <laughs> well, what does that mean? It, it doesn't matter what it means. It has nothing to do with you and that guy. It has nothing to do. That's what matters in this conversation right now. So yeah, Elijah did it. If you do the double anointing of Elijah, I'll talk mantles with you. <laughs> Till then, okay, I've gone way too long on that point. <laughs> okay, you, you hear the same topic, uh, don't touch God's anointed. And what the cult leader means, that's code for don't criticize my policies or my doctrines. If you have to use the threat don't touch God's anointed. It's only because you don't really believe you're anointed. If you believe you're anointed, you don't have to use that threat. You only have to use it because you're fearful nothing will happen if they do it. And the grace of God, the way it works anyway, nothing's going to happen to them anyway. So anyway, going on. Number two, our loyalty is to grow in connection to Jesus. That's our primary place of connection. We don't replace him with Jesus. And I mean, with the cult leader, we don't replace our relationship with Jesus with that cult leader. And we want to be obedient to Jesus' assignment, not the cult leader's assignment over our lives. Faithfulness is defined as doing the will of God and connecting to Jesus. That's what faithfulness is. Okay, let's go on to number five. The fifth characteristic of a cult is they cross biblical boundary lines of behavior. Now, everybody sins. I'm not talking about doing something wrong and then repenting of it and receiving mercy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about crossing biblical boundary lines and claiming that a supernatural experience gave you the authority to cross those biblical lines or twisting the Bible in a way that says, but you're different than the others. I mean, failing, repenting, and receiving mercy and calling the crossing of the line sin, I mean, that's the mercy of God, and God covers it. But I'm talking about these guys validate crossing those lines by claiming supernatural experiences or twisted interpretations of the Bible. Now let's look at number two under this, under paragraph E. The two main areas that are highlighted in Scripture, and these are not the only areas, by the way, but these are the two main ones that cult leaders always do. Now maybe this particular cult leader you're thinking about has it you know, morphed into it, and I'm using that in the negative sense, into this tendency yet, but they're a minute away if they are moving in that direction from both of these negative uh, things happening in their, under their leadership. It's covetousness. And the second one is sexual immorality. Covetousness, I'm talking about, they use their influence as a cult leader to be over all the money. The money's theirs. They may uh, twist how they do it. There's a hundred ways to cleverly deceive people to where you're over their money and their property without them fully connecting the dots that you are. But a cult leader always pushes for that financial issue and the issue of, of immorality. <clears throat> now let's uh, read 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Now Peter's talking about false leaders, false teachers. And again, if a false teacher has a close-knit group that they're tied with, he's that false leader, is a cult leader. 
It says in verse 3, by covetousness, they exploit. Now, instead of the word exploit, they, in a crafty way, they manipulate the control of your money. That's what they're after. In verse 14, it's not only do they have issues with money, they have issues with immorality. Their eyes are full of adultery. Look what it goes on to say in verse 14. Their heart is trained in covetous practices. These guys become skilled at tricking you out of the control of your own money. Now, typically what they'll say is it all belongs to the community. But the community is under their control. It belongs to them. That's, what, that's code for it's theirs. And we're doing it for the sake of the kingdom, but it's theirs at the end of the day. And there's, a, there's many different ways they can do this. They exploit. They, verse 18, they allure people through lust. And in this context, he's talking about immorality, lewdness, lust of the flesh. Now, the way a cult starts, they, they, probably, they usually start luring in their new members in the realm of money, getting control of their money and properties or in various ways. Sometimes it comes in stages. But they always get into immorality sooner or later. Even though they may preach against immorality, behind the veil they have biblical reasons, they claim, or supernatural reasons to validate why immorality is okay for them, though not for others. And so they don't repent of the immorality, they're bold in it. Again, falling and repenting is one thing. That's a whole different issue. They are bold in it. Now, the way cults start, they start through a series of stages to break down your barriers in the realm of sexual immorality. You know, I've heard of groups, they all get together and they give each other back rubs so they can relax. You know, alert, 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 alert. Don't go and get back rubs. They're built, they're breaking down your resistance is what that's happening. Then they remove a little bit of their clothing, but not too much. I mean, we're mature, we understand, because we want to have greater intimacy, and we can't have fear and barriers. Ugh, gross. <laughs> and they tell the one gal that says, ah, I don't know, they says, well, you have intimacy issues. The reason you're so touchy, or what they mean is non-touchy, you won't let us touch you. You have unsettled intimacy issues, and you need your space, and you need, but you know what? If you get healed, you'll be comfortable being touched. You know, there's 10 people in the group, and she goes, well, I want to be healed. I mean, surely I want that. Do I have intimacy issues? And all nine of them shake their head. Do you have intimacy issues? She goes, well, this doesn't sound right. But you are awfully anointed. Maybe it's okay. It's just all absolute deception. <clears throat> Number four, the Bible is strong. Sexual purity. Again, failure. I understand failure. I mean, there's failure all through the body of Christ. That's what mercy is about. But there's repentance. There's the declaration it's wrong. Ownership of property. The Bible, the rule of the Bible is people own their own money and property. Of course, the verse they all use is Acts 4. That occasion where they brought all their money, they put it at the feet of the apostles. But beloved, that was a one-time event to meet the need of the poor in that situation. This was not a 50-year economic arrangement where Peter was over all the property for 50 years out of everybody who joined the church. They, had, they preached the gospel, they had signs and wonders, and they had this extravagant display of generosity to the poor as the church was being established. Now, we care about generosity to the poor always, but never do we lose our own ownership and right to our money and our property, but it's always a free will offering as the need presents itself and the Spirit gives direction. Well, they use Acts 4 where all the money was brought to the apostles, and they make it a long-term arrangement, and it's just, it is not what the Spirit is saying, and it's not what the Bible intends for us to understand. Top of page four. <clears throat> Number six, separation from the church. Now, everyone in the church has the same two primary callings. Everybody does. We're all called in the primary sense to build the church and to work in the Great Commission. Everybody has that call. It looks different, but we all have the same two primary callings. But those two primary callings are expressed 
in specific assignments God gives individuals and ministries. And often, when another ministry's specific assignment is different than a cult's specific, well, they don't even have a specific assignment except for to, to disband. That's the really only assignment they have from the Lord. But they criticize the larger body of Christ because they don't operate the same way. And the scripture makes it clear, number two, we love the whole church. The whole church has weaknesses, deficiencies. We are deficient in love and wisdom. They are deficient in love and wisdom. We need each other to make up the things that we lack. This kind of wholesale attitude some people have, all the denominations are off, or all this kind of group uh, church, of churches, they're off because they don't do it the way we do it, or maybe they don't emphasize a few things that this group or that group emphasizes. We have to bless one another even in the midst of weaknesses and, def and, and, uh, and differences. Now, number four, and we'll look at this in a few weeks as we're working through the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, it's real clear. There are times to uh, bring righteous judgment, is the term Jesus used, to ministries with destructive behavior and destructive practices. There is a time to address it. We have to do it in the right way. We have to do it in the right process, the right spirit, the right information. Matthew 7, we'll look at that later. My point being, in our honoring, the culture of honor in the body of Christ that the Holy Spirit insists that we all buy into, I'm not saying we wink our eye at destructive doctrines and destructive behaviors, but when we do address them, we have to go to them in private, Matthew 18. Then we have to, there's a biblical protocol we must follow. Number seven, characteristic of a cult, is they emphasize special revelations that are outside of the Bible. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit emphasizing a biblical truth in a supernatural way. I'm talking about they have ideas and mandates that are outside of the boundaries of Scripture. And you can read that on your own. It's pretty self-explanatory. But this is one of the hooks that get people because these uh, would-be cult members are so desiring to have something special, to be something special, to stick out, to be unique. And when this leader says, I have something nobody else has, because well, it's not in the Bible, that's why he has it, they go, wow, we could be a part of something special. And that's part of the allurement. They can belong in a special way, and they can have a special assignment that's unique that nobody gets besides them. I mean, wh what a burden. I mean, you, uh, if there's a cult group out there of 100 or 500, I mean, could you imagine out of a billion Christians in the earth, your group of 500 is the only one in the earth that gets it? I mean, what a burden to live thinking a billion don't get it because Jesus' leadership is that bad and his leadership is only effective with, with 500 people and they all happen to be in your group. I mean, what a bizarre mindset. I don't know if you followed all that, but anyway, let's end with this. Roman numeral three, just the uh, first point. You can read this, uh, and we'll talk about it later, is that we judge by fruit. And fruit means words and deeds. We can't judge by discernment. We must judge by fruit. What I mean by discernment, discernment is very important. What I mean by discernment, I'm using it in this context. The Spirit gives you insight into somebody's problem. And that's, that's biblical. But here's what you do with that insight. When you get insight into somebody else's problem, that's a commission from the Lord for you to pray and, and or, we'll always pray, but secondly, for you to go to that person in a private way and begin in a kind and tender way to ask them questions about their beliefs and, and their practices. When you get discernment that somebody's wrong, you can't act on that by taking it to other people. You can only bring it to that person. Matter of fact, if you get discernment on it, the Holy Spirit's saying, I want you to, in a pastoral way, go talk to them about it. And in, don't accuse them. Use questions. Draw it out of them. But until they actually have wrong words and wrong deeds, wrong words are like, I'm the end time apostle. Nobody knows God besides me. That's, that's, that's fruit. That's bad fruit. And the reason we are restricted in our judgment, we can't operate off of just discernment except to go to them in private because 
The Lord is protecting the larger culture of the body of Christ. He doesn't want it filled with accusation and slander. And he's given that guy who's off time to repent, and he's using you as part of the pastoral process. So some people say, I get the, I get the insight. They go tell somebody else. Beloved, that's dignified slander. It's not even very dignified. But they say, well, I'm only doing it to pray. That is slander. You can only use that discernment to go to the person in private, and you can only bring discipline if, they, if it becomes words and deeds. It has to be fruit. Because the Lord wants to protect the larger environment of culture, the body of Christ, as being love doesn't mean that we're gullible, but we can't have a, a culture of suspicion. And so one thing we don't want after this of this cult that we've just discovered, we don't want every time somebody says something wrong, three people to hone in on them and they go, wait, wait, what happened? You know, like, I'm guilty till proven innocent, and I want us to have a heightened zeal, but I don't want us to use it in a wrong way. Amen. We're going to end with that.